to Spirit Seer's Cocktail Corner. I'm Mike, and today what I have for you is another cocktail from the 1917 book Recipes for Mixed Drinks by Hugo Inslin. Uh, this is called the Perfect Cocktail. I don't know a whole lot of the history behind it. I, I looked at it a little bit. I couldn't really find a whole lot. Uh, because it's just called the Perfect Cocktail, there's a lot of different variations and a lot of different names, and I haven't really found a true origin story for it. Uh, a lot of people have called their cocktail the perfect cocktail over the years. Uh, so I, I, it's kind of muddy and on this one. So I, I don't know a whole lot about it, but I know it's from this 1917 book. Uh, I highly recommend if you can get a hold of a copy of it, you do so, because there's a lot of really interesting things there. And, and the more I explore the cocktails here, the more I'm, I've found myself making episodes using those cocktails. So let's let's do that. So this is called the perfect cocktail, and this is kind of a little bit of a proto uh, a proto martini in sorts. Uh, it, it's, it uses equal parts uh, dry vermouth and gin, but where it varies, and this is where it kind of places it as a proto-martini, is that it also includes the sweet vermouth. Now let me crack some ice here. Now that, that uh, sweet vermouth, that, that doesn't really sound martini-like, but if you look at the history of, of the cocktail, you find another related cocktail that's kind of halfway between what we know today as the martini and the, 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 uh, the Manhattan from which the martini evolved. It's called a Martinez. And I actually had planned to create an entire episode with the whole panel and the whole group of spirit seers before this whole thing, the whole COVID thing happened. So unfortunately, that has not happened yet. It will happen. I really want to talk about the Martinez. It's a fascinating cocktail. But in the interim, if you have a chance to go check out the Martinez cocktail, make your own. I highly recommend you do so. It's a great cocktail. It is it is almost Manhattan-like in a gin cocktail. It's it's really halfway between the two. And I, I don't know how else to describe it other than it's halfway between a Manhattan and a Martini. And it's a fantastic cocktail. I really enjoy it. It actually doesn't even use gin. It uses Yennefer, uh, the grandfather of modern day gin. Fantastic spirit as well. It doesn't get used near often enough in my opinion. I, I think it's really fantastic. So without further ado, let's make this cocktail, shall we? So we're gonna use an ounce and a half all the way across. And I'm going to use the, the Water Pocket Distilling uh, Temple of the Moon Gin on this. And again, ounce and a half, ounce and a half, ounce and a half. It is really simple that way. So this is a fresh bottle of dry vermouth. I'm a gin guy, so I go through a lot of dry vermouth. I actually buy almost twice as much dry as I do sweet. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I go through a lot more sweet vermouth in winter when it's when it's Manhattan season. But now that it's martini season. So now we've got an ounce and a half of all three. Shake that over ice. Woo! That was almost that was a mess all over my kitchen. <laughs> Come on, break loose. There we go. Not doing it. I commented in an earlier episode that I've not had good luck with flip cocktails. Apparently my Boston shaker is going to uh, give me the middle finger there and say, oh, well, if you're gonna complain about having problems with uh, flip cocktails, I'll give you a problem with a non-flip cocktail instead. Because that's my luck. It kind of is just my luck. If you know me, you know I just don't have good luck with stuff. So this actually doesn't have any sort of information as to what the garnish is, but I really think in this case with the gin, the sweet vermouth, and the dry vermouth, I think an orange peel or even a lemon peel would probably be pretty fantastic with that. So I'm gonna go with an orange peel and grab my peeler here. As always, I express that into the cocktail. So it's not a very oily orange, regrettably, but I get a little bit of that, so. That is a very long orange peel. <laughs> it's all right. Mm -hmm. 
So on the nose, you get a lot of the fruit of the orange. You also get, the, the vermouth actually sits very forward on this, which is surprising. There's a real trend with these 1917 cocktails where the vermouth actually is really far forward, more so than you would expect with a cocktail. Uh, usually the vermouth is not really in a nose element. It doesn't really sit on the nose. It's more of a, uh, more of, it sits on the tongue, whether it's a little bit of sweet red wine or it's a dry white wine sort of flavor. You don't really get it on the nose so much. But this, again, that is very clearly white wine, dry white wine vermouth right there on the nose. And then you, you take a sip and you get, you get the gin and it phases into the sweet vermouth and then loops back around to the dry vermouth again. So the, the vermouth kind of is the finish on the nose, but it's also the finish on the tongue as well. It's a, a really interesting cocktail. These, these pre-prohibition cocktails, a lot of people talk down on them. A lot of people don't really like them so much. I think that's really unfortunate because there's some really interesting things and, and some really simple uh, simple ingredients and some really simple aspects of these pre-prohibition cocktails that don't have a bajillion and a half ingredients like ooh, what I have done with my penultimate. I, I reference that cocktail a lot, but it's it's kind of, it was the first cocktail I ever created myself completely from scratch. And it was, it's kind of become a little bit of a benchmark where it's, okay, it was interesting, it's fascinating with all of those ingredients, but this with three ingredients and an orange peel is somehow more interesting to me. It's, it's more complex, it's more, it's more enjoyable, it's more sippable. There's, there's something to be said for something that is just simple. Two, three ingredients. I have a few more cocktails that I'm planning on filming here. I, I actually film a batch of like four or five cocktails. And I've got another one coming up that is just two ingredients. And it's simple. It's, it, I, I hesitate to call it basic. I, I keep trying to call it basic because it is such a simple, a simple ingredient set. But it is anything but basic. It's complex. It's rich. It's enjoyable. It's... It is, I don't know, it's it's sweet, it's dry, it's, and I know those seem contradictory, they're not in this cocktail. You, you have a little bit of the sweet and then it drops into a dry note of the finish, and you have the orange on the nose that really sits well with the, the gin. Uh, the gin is actually a little bit of a, it sits a little bit of the back on this one. I think a really juniper forward gin will be fantastic on this. Uh, this is an absolutely fantastic gin for this as well, but it's still, it's, it's simple, but it's so complex and the flavor changes the more you let it sit on your tongue and it's, it's thoroughly enjoyable. It's, there's something to be said for something that is three ingredients and it's still such a great cocktail like the Manhattan. There's a reason it's a classic cocktail. It's three ingredients, sweet vermouth, whiskey, and bitters. It's that simple. And it's not a gin Manhattan because that is a thing, but it's it's the, the gin equivalent of simplicity's sake for the Manhattan. It's it's simple, it's enjoyable, it's, it's fantastic. Go make you one, keep the spirits.